now. Welcome everyone to Optimization in Oslo. Today, we're very happy to have Florian Schaefer from uh, Georgia Tech, who is going to talk about solvers, models, learners towards statistical scientific computing. So Florian, the floor is All right. Here. Thank you very much for the invitation. <clears throat> so <clears throat> yeah, so today I was going to talk about three um, not directly related topics, but that all, I guess, have this underlying uh, th uh, theme of of using ideas from um, statistical inference and um, machine learning to 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 solve at part at times cl fairly classical problems in uh, in um, in scientific computing. And so the first part we'll talk about reconstructing solution operators of elliptic PDEs from matrix vector products or from solution pairs. Then we're going to talk uh, briefly about the, the multi-agent methods for the high accuracy training of pins. And finally, I'm going to talk about uh, a very recent work on um, on using information geometry to regularize the, the uh, compressible Euler equations. So the first uh, the, uh, the first work I'm to present this is a joint work with Kumano Hadi, and that is uh, was recently accepted to CISC. <clears throat> And so I'm going to start by laying out the, the setting for the rigorous results, even though, as with all things numeric analysis, there's a certain, I mean, then there's always that regime where things seem to still work fine, but we cannot necessarily prove them. So this is just for the, for the prover results. So we assume we have a domain in RD with Lipschitz boundary. We have a linear elliptic PDE. So here I've uh, shown you some bilaplasian, but this allows for arbitrary uh, sort of integer order um, rough rough coefficients as long as uh, as the the operator is uh, is uh, boundless, bounded uh, and boundedly invertible between h s and h minus s, and then we take uh, we define the Green's function as the inverse in the sense of convolution of the differential operator with directly boundary conditions. So for everything here, we are I mean we're working in h zero s, so we work with zero uh, with directly boundary conditions. And now we want to discretize this. So either what we what we're going to do is so we're going to discretize this uh, the solution operator in the sort of Ha basis functions. So that basically we we start with a global basis function, then we take sort of uh, we subdivide it and take sort of uh, uh, linear combinations that are orthogonal to that global function, and so on and so forth. We because we subdivide that's one way to get a basis set, and then we we use that to discret to discretize our Green's function to get this matrix theta. Alternatively, in some settings, we might already be working with a theta with a solution operator that's given by a by a PD operator. In this case, we would use whatever fine element space or so that this operator is discretized, and we would use linear combination of these basis elements to sort of uh, to artificially reproduce such a um, hard type multi resolution basis. Or if we have a sufficiently high order, we would also just pick a pair, pick a bunch of like points that are roughly uniformly distributed in the domain. So all these would be viable discretizations of the solution operator for our purposes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so the problem is now we want to say we want to se select a, a set of right hand sides and <clears throat> apply a solution operator to these right hand sides to get the sort of the FIs of the right sides, US are the solutions. And then we want to reconstruct this uh, uh, an approximation of the original solution operator from the UIs and also, of course, the, the FIs. So basically, how many solution pairs do we need to get how accurate uh, an approximation of the, uh, of the PD solution operator? So I guess, at least in the present day, the, the first order motivation of this is to ask the question, what is the sample complexity of learning solution operators of PDEs? And with all the sort of neural operator, deep ONet, BCR net, there have been a lot of interest, obviously, in learning solution operators of PDEs. So uh, it, this is a, a very simple setting, linear elliptic. What are the sort of uh, fundamental sample complexities? And then this has implications for inverse problems because uh, in some ways, it allows us to maybe first reconstruct the solution operator, then just use the surrogate solution operator to solve our inverse problem instead of having to further physical measurements. And finally, there's uh, there might be settings where one has a sort of legacy solver that is slow or not easy to parallelize, and, and so that we want to sort of reconstruct in this nice fashion without having to go into the code. Admittedly, that last motivation is maybe a bit. I mean, I haven't yet come with a really 
plausible example will be actually useful, but that's, I guess, a hypothetical use case. And so there has been a lot of uh, related work. So I guess the first line of, um, I mean, the first thing one can do is to do things based on eigen decompositions, right? And so there was the work by the Hope Edda, Steve Kernand, Nelson Stewart, that do I the eigen decomposition based methods, but because the uh, eigenfunctions of the solution operators decay to polynomially, then also the to get a given target accuracy, one gets a uh, only a, a, I mean, one needs a polynomial in the target accuracy number of matrix vector products. Then there have been algorithms uh, empirically targeting the hierarchical matrix approximation of these operators. So the the first line of work of this line of work is uh, the paper by Lin et al. Uh, and so here in gray, I've given you the sort of uh, the sort of uh, hypothetical uh, complexity one could hope for in the best case, but this was not proven because the the sort of error propagation in these algorithms is very intricate. Um, the first sort of, I guess, end-to-end -end rigorous proof for uh, for, um, for general cases, <clears throat> depending on how you how how picky you are when it comes to defining rigorous proof, was probably given by Boulay and Townsend uh, in 2021. But this is was <clears throat> again uh, ending up being based on a randomized SVD, so that was again requiring a sort of polynomial number of uh, matrix vector products. So you see this epsilon to the minus six. And furthermore, if you look at their work, they have this gamma epsilon term, which they do not control over. So, so in principle, this term could grow arbitrarily badly and um, and and make these make these uh, these uh, these estimates vacuous. And after the present work, there was a follow. There was a uh, another paper by Bull, uh, Halikia, and Townsend that provides a first sort of error tracking of this Linnet R result. Um, giving some sort of full logarithmic, full logarithmic complexity. <laughs> However, again, including a sort of a gamma over epsilon, uh, gamma of epsilon term that is not being bounded. And again, this is, this is work um, that, that appeared after. Um, this is uh, work uh, later work. So our result. So here on the top left, I have shown again the the sort of best case Linnet al sample complexity. So how many samples one could hope for in that sort of H matrix approximation um, if everything goes through according to our, uh, if, if all the sort of error propagation goes through without any problems. Our result basically says that for, we need log to the D plus one uh, matrix vector products um, and uh, sort of a near linear amount of computation to compute this Koleski factor L with a, with near linear, a near linear amount of non-zeros. And so we already see that then if we um, if we pick the uh, the n to be a polynomial in one of epsilon, we can actually um, we can actually prove rigorously that to obtain one epsilon one of epsilon uh, to obtain epsilon accuracy of the solution operator, we need a log of log to the d plus one uh, matrix vector products. And so this is um, so this is not only does it does it give us sort of a rigorous uh, 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 full logarithmic complexity, but it also improves by one logarithmic factor over what one could get um, if if the sort of error propagation, if one would, in the best possible scenario of how the error propagation would work out in the H matrix based method. So the key ingredient is going to be a, a sparse Koleski factorization. Um, and so in, in prior work, um, we have showed that the Choosing the right ordering and sparsity, so choosing the right ordering of the Koleski effect of the rows and columns of this matrix theta, so the solution operator matrix, that the <coughs> that the, the Koleski factors are almost sparse. So the ordering is so the the ordering is as such that we take our wavelet basis, and then we just order the wavelets from cost to fine, or and and then. If we we choose a sparsity pattern by picking a factor rho, and then we keep sort of for each of these sort of wavelets coefficients, uh, we keep the coefficient we keep the interactions that correspond to uh, that that are within a distance of rho this tuning parameter times the the scale of the support of this wavelet basis. So here on the left, I've shown you the sort of the basis element as as spatial functions. I've, I've shown you the basis elements 
on four different levels. So these wavelet functions in which we are using to discretize the solution operator on four different levels. And then in the middle, you see the sparsity pattern uh, of such a Koleski factor of the green uh, of the Green's matrix theta. You see the sparsity pattern again, color coded according to what scale the the the, the, the column. So what scale of the wavelet base the column corresponds to. And then on the right, you see the sort of exemplary columns of the of the Skoleski factors, again, plotted as spatial functions. And so you see that the, the big wavelet on the large scale has a produces a column that is roughly <clears throat> has a, I mean, is sort of de rapidly decaying roughly on a size of that, uh, of, of the original wavelet, so of this wavelet. Similarly, then this like like next smaller wave wave produces the next smaller sort of or like more localized Koleski factor, and next more localized uh, wave produces an even more localized Koleski factor, and so on and so forth. And alternatively, we can also do a course to find ordering with what's kind of often called lazy wavelets, which just means we keep ordering the points from the by selecting the point that is furthest uh, to the point that we have already selected. <laughs> and then we again pick our sparsity set as a, uh, we pick the entries that are within a constant row times the sort of the length scale, so distance from the nearby points of, of the point of each of the points. <clears throat> and so, so now, so this is uh, this was prior work that showed that basically up to exponentially small errors, the Koleski factors. Of Green's matrices, if we are using these costs to find orderings or basis um, basis functions, are, uh, are have non-zeros that are within these sort of these sparsity sets that only contain a near linear amount, number of non-zeros. And that maybe should be quite surprising because typically we think of Koleski factorization as something that starts with a sparse matrix and then produces a denser and denser matrix, and you have we have to work very hard <laughs> to sort of contain the densification of that matrix. So here we're basically saying the reverse that even though the original Green's matrix theta is dense, we are saying that, and that's again mostly that's something we showed in previous work, uh, that the 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 Koleski factors of the Green's matrix are actually almost sparse. And um, at first this may be a bit surprising, but it's not so surprising if you look at um, Koleski factorization through a probabilistic perspective. So if we take x to be, let's say, distributed according to a Gaussian with theta being its covariance, and then basically Koleski factorization is the recursive application of this matrix identity here. Right? So each time we apply it, and then we apply it afterwards to the bottom right block of this like matrix in the middle, and so on and so forth, and we keep pulling out the lower and upper triangular factors to the left and to the right. Now it turns, and if you've worked with Gaussian process before, you you will probably see that the quantities appearing in this matrix identity are really the conditional expectation of the Gaussian process and the conditional covariance. So, in other words, the conditional near independence of X results in the almost sparsity of Koleski factors of theta. So suddenly, the sort of pluralistic way of thinking about Gaussian elimination gives us a whole new uh, way of reasoning about where we might find sparsity in these matrices, even though they're dense, so the usual sort of graph-based heuristics of where to find sparsity do not really apply, by, by saying, basically by knowing that there are many interesting stochastic processes that are a priori densely correlated, but after you condition on just the right variable, they become uncorrelated uh, or like less correlated, that immediately implies that there must be interesting sparse Koleski factors of dense matrices flying around somewhere. And for these spatial problems, there was a sort of a, a heuristic of where to find the conditional independence of these uh, um, processes for a long time that was known as a screening effect. And the idea is just that if I, if I have a smooth process and I have a function, a value here that I want to know, and you give me the value here, I'm not going to pay a lot of money to know the value here because the more nearby points give you more information. And so here we have this red point and in orange we see the uh, we see the conditional correlation conditioned on these big blue points and now when in a moment this is going to start again and so we're going to see that as we add more blue points so we condition on more points the correlations of the red points are being screened they're being sort of contained uh, within a length scale of the of the nearest blue points that we conditioned on and this is the sort of probabilistic effect that enables this sparsity and um by using and uh, expanding tools on uh, from numerical modularization, we were able to prove this. But I, I won't have the, the time here to, to go into the details of that. 
So, but <clears throat> for our purposes, we now know that these matrices uh, that we want to reconstruct, they have almost bar Kolesky factors. That's what we're going to work with. Now, really what we have to do here is we have to find a way to construct multiple sort of, to basically get multiple matrix vector products out of a single matrix vector product. Because if we don't have that, then we would be bound by the decay rate of the eigenvalues. And that's uh, that's polynomial in epsilon, but we want polylogarithmic in epsilon. So there is a um, an old idea of how to construct sparse matrices by coloring, which is basically that if we have a sparse matrix that has disjoint uh, that has disjoint uh, some columns with disjoint support, mm -hmm. then we can um, we can choose a right hand side that only activates such a set of columns with disjoint support, and then all the the non zeros of all these columns get written into a single vector, and then we can pull it apart, and so. Tada, we have been able to reconstruct three columns of this matrix for just a single matrix vector product. And now we can actually do the same thing by uh, if, if we have a Kolesky factor where the leading columns are sparse. And so the idea is now that we're going to choose as right hand side sort of the sort of we are choosing these sort of spatially separated pulses on a given scale. And so this is sort of the sparsity set of the corresponding part of the Kolesky factor. And then we, we get a sort of a set of locally separated responses. And then afterwards, we just uh, we just make each of these responses one, one of our output vectors. Like we pull apart this one vector containing many localized pulses into, let's say in this case, 16 separate vectors, each containing a localized pulse and lots of zeros. Now, the problem is that uh, there, may be, there may be some sort of initially dense columns in our Kolesky factorization. And so what we can then simply do is we first pay a matrix vector product to identify this dense column. And, when, and then we subtract the corresponding outer product from our matrix whenever we apply it to a vector. And so this allows us to basically remove already identified denser elements in order to, uh, in order to expose the, the juicy sparsity that, that lies beneath it. And so in this case, what this means is we operate sort of from cost to find. So we first identify these coarser elements like the, like the wave in, in, in red. And then we subtract it to, to first reveal the sparsity of the elements in blue, which we then also subtract to reveal the sparsity of the elements in yellow, which we then also subtract. Uh, and, and then we finally get the even greater sparsity of the elements in, uh, in dark green here. And then whenever, so whenever we have, we have such a, we get such a response from sort of uh, spatially separated wavelets, we, 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 we use this sort of scatter operation so here we have these like four, the non-zero of these four vectors that I've so sort of shown a spatial function on the left. We use a scatter operation to reconstruct four columns from it. And then, and then the resulting algorithm <clears throat> for recovering the matrix from these matrix vector products, it's, uh, it, it looks like so. It's basically, it's a very similar to a Kuleski factorization. <clears throat> now, the main sort of analytic contribution of this work was the... Uh, um, the sort of how to control the error propagation there. And so basically the problem is that each time you do, if you just do a single step of Gaussian elimination, you basically have to pay a sort of sure complement. Uh, you have to use a sort of sure complement perturbation bound, which has a sort of multiplicative error. And so there's a problem that if you do this naively, basically you have an exponential growth and error. So in order to get around this, what we had to do was to use these, this like super node idea where we basically group multiple points uh, into into a block and um, and at least on the level of the analysis, then use a sort of block Kolesky factorization instead of the element wise Kolesky factorization. Uh, so I here for this kind of talk, I don't have have time really to go into the details of that. And so there are some other nice properties of this factorization, which is that if we have a if we take only the k leading columns of this resulting factor, that's also a near optimal low rank uh, approximation. It also seems to work for fractional operators for a reason that, at least on the theoretical level, I still don't have an idea, but I think that can be a nice, uh, actually a nice application because uh, we, it might allow us to use one something like a iterative method of Fourier transform based methods to compute the solution of a um, of a such a fractional operator, and then afterwards we we can we have this sort of sparse factorized form of the solution operator of the fractional operator. Um, and there's also like the LU variant of this also works on advection diffusion problems. 
And uh, so there are some numerical results. So we see, uh, I mean, we see that the uh, that the as we increase this tuning parameter rho, we see that the the error drops uh, at an exponential rate, as as we would hope. And so just to give some sort of quantitative ideas, so for instance, for a two sixty uh, two sixty thousand square problem, um, so two sixty thousand size problem, we need maybe around uh, two thousand matrix vector products to recover it to signal precision. And yeah, so again, somewhat surprisingly, this these results hold true also for fractional operators without really much of a change. Um, and we also have some, uh, so, I mean, we have some results so, uh, for, for applying this to sort of uh, less, less structured settings, like for instance, uh, the uh, final element mesh of this, I, know, I guess canonical mechanical part from whatever was the final element library that I, uh, that I found. Um, I, so, um, yeah, and then I want to briefly, very briefly mention that we also applied this. So this was joint work with uh, Spencer Brungus and Jesse Liu and Ali Mani. We applied this to some sort of recovery problems in uh, sort of reduced order model recovery problems in computation fluid dynamics. And again, what we see that even for these problems that are kind of not really, don't really fit exactly into the sort of elliptic solution operator setting, um, so there are some kind of uh, generalized any diffusivity operators that we're recovering here, but we see that we at least do substantially better than uh, the SVD or the randomized SVD. So summary, we get the sort of uh, log D plus one uh, um, complexity for learning the uh, for learning solution operators of elliptic linear elliptic PDEs, uh, which gives us basically an exponential improvement in the sample complexity of learning these operators compared to the prior work. Uh, and we, uh, so this seems to work well, both in the settings where the theorem is hold, but also in some slightly more loose settings, for instance, this operator recovery problem in CFD. <clears throat> okay, so that was the first, uh, the first instance of, uh, I guess, this, seeing this interplay between scientific computing, but then looking both, in terms of this project was both looked at the solving elliptic PDE through a slightly probabilistic lens because we um, were using this screening effect idea to discover the sparse Koleski factorization of the solution operators. And then also using these results to solve a slightly more learning flavored problem, which is how to reconstruct the solution operators of elliptic PDEs from matrix vector products. Um, now for the next part, there's going to be a, a, a bit of a change of scenery. So this is uh, joint work with Xi Zheng, who was an undergraduate student with me that's now doing a master's at UC Berkeley, uh, Josh Kotari, an undergrad at uh, Georgia Tech, and Spencer Brungerson, uh, which, is, uh, which is the high accuracy training of physics informed neural networks. Um, so for physics informed neural networks, right, the idea is that we, we train a pin, uh, so we train a neural network to minimize uh, the sum of a sort of a, the squared PDE residual and the, the squared boundary residual. So I I assume that at this point in this in this crowd uh, this uh, I mean pins are re reasonably familiar, so I'm not going to go uh, too much through the details. Um, and uh, right, so for instance, for a Poisson problem, we would uh, this is sort of how the architecture would look like, and then one uses uh, automatic differentiation or to evaluate these sort of Laplace, uh, uh, Laplace operators or whatever is the differential operators in the loss function. Now, the nice things about pins is that they can very easily at least be applied to new PDE um, and they can seamlessly combine data and PDEs just because it's all stuff that goes to the loss function, then you train and you hope for the best. And there is this hope, even though I, I would say this has not really been fully substantiated yet, there is the hope that neural network-based methods may be uh, um, maybe a way out in problems that are suffering from high dimensionality. So things like Hamilton, Kobe Bellman, um, many body quantum mechanics and so on and so forth. Even though again, like I'm, from my understanding as a bit of an outside of this community, I, I'm not sure this has really uh, thoroughly been established that they, they can break the curse of dimensionality. Um, but the problem is that they do need many care they need careful tweaks for many of the problems. So they, even though you can apply them to many problems, they don't necessarily automatically work. And even on benign problems, the accuracy is typically quite limited. Um, and so to overcome 
at least the second the second part of the problem what we did in this work we introduced what we call competitive physics from networks which is basically a sort of generator discriminator type of framework for uh for pin optimization so we now have two networks that have essentially the same structure so we have our um so we have our sort of uh, our pin the, the the p network which we i guess we which basically plays from a gun perspective plays the role of a generator and then we have the discriminator network d that um uh, that is trying to call out errors of the of the generator. So in the case of the Poisson problem, this is how our loss would look like. That we um, so here on the here on the left we would see the the loss of the pin, and on the right we basically now have the the loss that is affected both by the pin through the through the choice of what this u uh, what this u restrict to the boundary is and what the um, uh, what the the Laplace of u is. And then we have the discriminator that basically has to learn the sort of has to learn a coefficient to put in front of those. And uh, really, the idea here is that the discriminator places a bet on the pin residuals. So basically, if it gets rewarded, then uh, so if it guesses correctly, so if it says that in a given point the residual is positive, or for systems of PDE the residual points in a certain direction. And it gets it's right, then it gets rewarded, the pin gets penalized. <laughs> Otherwise, it's the, op the, op the opposite way around where uh, the discriminator gets uh, penalized and the pin gets rewarded. And so one thing that I want to <clears throat> point out is that this is, um, oh, and then in the Nash equilibrium, so uh, the, uh, this, uh, the, the PDE is solved exactly because that would be a case where there's no way for the discriminator to, to sort of like benefit to so sort of capitalize on any mistakes by the generator anymore. And one thing I want to point out is that because I get asked this quite a lot is that this is not a reweighting of the loss. So there are many works that are reweighting the loss at different points. So they they try to adaptively choose the sampling points or the sampling weights in the sort of Monte Carlo approximation of the loss. This is very different because here we we are not the thing that that so the discriminator puts out a scalar that can be both positive or negative, and this scalar gets multiplied. With a residual that can be go both positive or negative, which is, and so whereas in these like weighting problems, the discriminator would put a number would put out a number that's positive, and would be multiplied with a squared residual that's also guaranteed to be positive, and so this reweighting doesn't really have a very interesting game structure because in some of the best thing for the discriminator is just to crank the weight up everywhere as much as possible, whereas here really the discriminator has to sort of the, has to has to be careful because if they uh, put like a large positive value somewhere, but then the, the error actually undershoots, then they suddenly get a big penalty. And there is a sort of a linear algebra analogy for why this is maybe not so crazy an idea, is that which is that in a sort of if we take a very, very special network um, that is basically designed to 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 reproduce a fine element type uh, Galerkin type approximation. Um, then we basically see that the pin would solve the, the resulting linear algebra system by a least squares method. And so we know that this leads to a squaring of the condition number, which is why this is usually avoided, uh, why this is usually avoided in the numerical linear, um, sort of numerical PDE literature. And instead, when we're using the, the sort of minimax problem, we are the resulting system matrix still is in this expanded form where at least in principle we have access to both the the A and the A transpose separately. And so that, uh, at least if we are using them, uh, if we're using them uh, perfect, if we're, if we're using them the right way, allows us to, to sort of overcome the, the worst case bounds that we would uh, obtain from this uh, squared condition number. And uh, so how do we solve the saddle point problem? So that that uh, tied back to some earlier work I did with Anima and Kumar. Um, where the idea is basically how do we generate uh, generalized grain descent to simultaneous grain descent because we now need an algorithm to solve these multi-agent optimization problems. Uh, sorry, we were trying to generalize grain descent. And so commonly this is done with simultaneous grain descent, but that tends to diverge even on a sort of bilinear problem, right? That was a very popular story in the sort of gun literature from a few years back. And so in order to come up with a uh, with an algorithm that that does better, we were sort of revisiting the problem and reminding ourselves that the, we can write grain descent as this variational characterization, where we say 
Each step of gradient descent is the minimization of a local linear objective with a quadratic penalty. And you could think of this basically the agent only sees like the local linear objective and tries to do the best based on seeing that local linear linear approximation. But now uh, the agent knows that this linear approximation is not valid everywhere. So we the agent adds the sort of quadratic penalty that prevents them from making overly large steps because they know they cannot trust this approximation everywhere. Now, from this perspective, it seemed that the natural generalization to um, to multi-agent optimization should be that the agency a sort of linear approximation of the game, and then the um, and then put a sort of quadratic penalty on the size of their movement because they don't trust this approximation everywhere. And then we are solving for the local Nash for the Nash equilibrium of this local game, an analogy to the optimal value of this sort of local single player game that gradient descent solves. And now the question is, how do we linearize a game? Because if we uh, if we only sort of take the take the linear approximation, which uh, I guess which maybe appears first as the most natural thing to do, then we see that actually the actions of the, the actions of the two agents do not depend on each other, and so we recover exactly simultaneous gradient descent. Because now in this local linear game, basically there's no x y terms. So what is a good decision for x only does not depend on what y does, and what's a good decision for y does not depend on what what x does. Whereas if we add a bilinear part of the approximation to this uh, um, to this local game approximation, then now what is a good decision for X depends on what Y does, and what's a good decision for Y depends on what X does. And so this sort of modified local game approximation sort of preserves the idea that it comes from a competitive game, which is not really possible if you're just taking a linear approximation instead of a bilinear or more generally multilinear approximation. And then there's sort of a closed form solution for the for the national equilibrium that, that makes this algorithm. And so the 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 upshot of now applying this uh, and so what we do is now we, we use this algorithm to train pins and what we see or to train the C pins so this competitive pins. And what we see is that um, we obtain sort of accuracies up to basically almost ten to the minus eight on these. I mean these are very simple problems. These are sort of two D Poisson problems. However, at least to our knowledge, before this work, there were no sort of general purpose pin methods that were able to achieve sort of uh, these like beyond single precision accuracies, even on these very simple problems. And so that was quite encouraging that we see the sort of systematic improvement of the error up to yeah single precision. And presumably we could, we could go beyond just that all of these things are very expensive. I mean, training these to this accuracy takes a lot of time. So at some point we, we just decided to stop. Um, but so, so that is, I, I would say, the main sort of achievement of this work is that we're able to finally train pins, at least on these very simple problems, to uh, to seemingly arbitrary accuracy. So we also tried some sort of nonlinear problems, like a nonlinear Schrodinger problem, uh, Burgers and uh, Allen Kahn equation. And we see that definitely, in particular for the Allen Kahn, that there seem to be some other issues that are also appearing in the um, uh, in the training of pins that that our method doesn't fully address. So this is not a sort of uh, this is this is not going to make automatically make a, any pin pin work in all situations. But what it does is that at least in settings where things go well, it seems to be able to sort of solve the sort of optimization issues of being being tied to being tied to low accuracy. Uh, and here I should mention that because competitive grain descent needs a sort of an inner loop linear solve, so that's why. Here I have always have shown two plots. On the left we see the outer iterations, and on the right we see the number of forward paths, so the number of um, uh, gradient computations or matrix vector products. And so we see that we 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 have an improvement compared to uh, um, to pin with with Adam um, both uh, uh, both in terms of the outer and also in terms of the inner iterations. And the inner iterations are essentially up to constant. They seem to be tracking the overall computational time quite well. Um, so in summary, we extend the grain descent to competitive optimization, uh, which is a sort of like a, gives us this bilinear, uh, um, we would use this sort of bilinear approximation for the, um, oh, uh, is I, this is actually the summary slide for great CGD, I just realized. But so the summary is really that we're able to, to train uh, pins, to, pins to high accuracy using this uh, competitive grain. Compared to gradient descent approach. Um, 
And now we're going to, for the last 15 minutes, I want to uh, give a sort of a, a brief overview over the over a last uh, way in which sort of statistical inference or ideas from statistical inference and uh, scientific computing uh, sort of come together, which is the information geometric regularization uh, of the biotropic Euler equation. So again, this is a, a change of scenery. So we have a, uh, what we are, what we're dealing with here is we are interested in the uh, barotropic compressible Euler equation. So the, basically the conservation of mass and momentum in a sort of inviscid gas flow. So uh, here yeah, I use the velocity, uh, rho is the density, and, and P is the pressure. And so barotropic just means that we assume that this pressure depends only on rho and not on other variables, even though I would say, I, I believe that this approach can be generalized to, to more general sort of uh, material laws. It's just uh, that we didn't have time to do that yet. Um, and this equation, now going to the 1D case to make things a bit simpler, has two main modes of behavior. So one of them are sound waves. So basically, if we have only very small variations in, in, in pressure, we see this sort of, uh, in, in pressure and velocity, we see this sort of sound waves propagate through the, through the gas. So these are the sound waves that I used to speak to you right now. <clears throat> and then the, the second mode of behavior is a sort of nonlinear mode of behavior, which is transport, which means that if we actually have large velocities, then instead of, of, of having the like of having these sound waves, we actually see sort of we see the gas moving systematically. And as a result, we we, we see the sort of uh, movement of our velocity profile. So here, yeah, um, the top is velocity, bottom is density. And now really an important uh, 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 result of this sort of transport phenomenon is that we have the formation of shock waves. So shock waves arise from most initial conditions in a compressive flow. It just, it's just a matter, uh, if, in the Euler equation at least, it's just a matter of how long it takes. And um, in, intuitively, the reason why the shock waves arise is because you have basically faster upstream particles catching up with slower downstream particles. And as a result, and then eventually they collide and that's what, uh, what creates a sort of shock wave, these jumps in both the velocity and the den uh, density. And um, so these are, um, these of course prevent having classical solutions of the PDE because if you have a jump, it's hard to really find the derivative of it. And, and so the sort of canonical solution concept for these equations is a vanishing viscosity solution. So basically we say we add a small viscosity to our, to, to our equation, solve this equation. And then basically we, we do this again and again, but for smaller and smaller viscosity. And in the limit of the viscosity going to zero, the limit of the solutions is what we consider to be the solution of the, or the, the physical solution of this sort of uh, compressible Euler equation. Um, without viscosity. And so shock waves appear in a lot of important applications. So astrophysics, aerospace, and medicine, for example. And so this, this is a sort of numerically very challenging problem that at the same time has enormous sort of practical and technological implications. And of course, like we could say, so what's the problem? We, 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 we just, we, we know how to compute these viscosity, uh, vanishing viscosity solutions. We just I mean, add a small viscosity and solve the resulting Navier-Stokes system. However, the problem is that the um, that the sort of as we decrease the viscosity in the sort of vanishing viscosity limit, we also have to increase the mesh size. And so, for for most practical problems, we cannot afford to simply resolve our uh, uh, resolve our grid to an hour so finely that we 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 can get away with a uh, with an acceptable amount of viscosity. And so. There's a rich literature on, of, on more clever numerical methods to, to deal with this uh, to deal with this problem. So there, are, one can add viscosity adaptively. There, are sort of one can sort of drop to a lower order numerical method close to a shock. Um, there are essentially non-oscillatory schemes. Uh, one can track shock from explicitly, or one can stitch together the solution based on uh, so uh, the solution of so-called Riemann problems. So these are at least uh, for my still somewhat outside perspective. So I've only been working on this problem for a year. For a year. Um, these are kind of seem to be the main, um, uh, the main routes of attack. Now in this work, my student Rija uh, and I, we introduced instead an inviscid regularization of the PDE, uh, which we call information geometric regularization. And so I'm going to try to give you the, the main idea of how this 
regularization is derived. And to do this, I'm going to, rest, um, so here you see the regularization is, is this PDE here. And um, it's obtained from a sort of, from a differential geometric perspective where we are, uh, we are observing that the Euler equation is a, is really a sort of, can be seen as a geodesic or a solution of a Newton equation on the manifold of diffeomorphisms. And we, we directly regularize the geometry of these diffeomorphisms and then pull back this, uh, the sort of modified dynamic system of the diffeomorphisms. We pull that back to a PDE and that's the PDE that we get here. And before I move on, just a quick note, uh, there, there is an elliptic problem here that we have to solve to sort of obtain this correction F, but because the alpha is chosen to be very small, this elliptic problem is very, very cheap. Uh, to solve, so I um, you're welcome to to ask me more on this later. It's just because I usually get this question, so I figured I, I get it out of the way right away. Um, and so, yeah. So to explain this uh, this regularization, we're going to start with the uh, we're going to start with the Burgess equation, uh, which is basically a simplified version of the Euler equation, where we set the pressure and the force to zero, and uh, then we can do some simplification. We obtain the, the Euler equation in uh, Burgess equation in the form that you have maybe seen from textbooks. And um, the Burgess equation is typically uh, is typically solved by the method of characteristics. So we basically we define these sort of straight lines that for for so phi t of x is a straight line that starts in x and moves with a velocity given by the initial velocity in that point. And so we can think of them as basically as being the trajectories of individual gas particles that are now, because we have set the pressure to zero, these gas particles are not interacting. So they're just kind of like flying their way. And as a result, we can obtain, uh, we, are, we can obtain our solution U of the Burgess equation by simply at each point, we sort of see what is the particle that is flying through this point right now. We trace it back to the initial condition and we plug in the initial condition to, uh, at the point where we trace it back to, uh, to obtain our U in this point. Now we can show that this sort of, this solution solves the Euler equation. Now these characteristics, these sort of uh, particle trajectories, um, they are intimately related to the shock formation because in the Burgers equation, characteristic, uh, so shocks form exactly when characteristics cross. And so that further sort of uh, motivates this intuition that shocks in these equations are really arising from the collision of, of gas particles. And so here you see in this sort of GIF, you see in, in, in light blue, you see the velocity profile of the, so the, the U profile of the Burgess equation. And in this darker, uh, this green blue, you see the, uh, you see the trajectories um, uh, of the gas particles or the characteristics of the Burgess equation. And you see they're moving in time and the moment the characteristics cross, that's also the moment when the velocity profile becomes singular for the first time. <laughs> and so um, the interesting question, of course, of what happens to these characteristics after they cross? So after we form a shock. And it turns out that the physical way to continue this characteristics picture is to, uh, is to say that the characteristics are merging. So that basically means that the, the, the sort of Burgers particles, so the, the gas particles that the Burgers equation describes, they're basically like sticky balls. So when they, when they collide, they stick together and then they move with their average velocity so to conserve momentum, but they dissipate as much energy as possible, like, which is why they, 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 it's a, basically they operate according to a, a fully inelastic collision. And, um, and so, so far what I've, been telling you about the Euler and Burgess equation is all sort of very classical, um, but now we want we want to get to something a little more uh, uh, a little more new, which is a connection between constraint optimization and uh, and the Burgess equation, or more generally the, the the Euler equation. And so, if we now look at this sort of diagram here, right? This diagram shows the basically it shows the characteristics starting in x one and x two. They collide and then they merge. Now we can also equivalently keep track of this of these pairs of characteristics in the sort of phi x1, phi x2 plane. So now this is basically a path that at t equal to zero is here because the, the two uh, the two particles are, are not on the same position yet. And then it moves towards this middle line where the two particles have the same position, and then it continues along this diagonal, which corresponds to the um 
which corresponds to the, the uh, so the diagonal are the points where the two so are the points of phase where the two particles have exactly this, the same position. And uh, and here the sort of lower right triangle, the reason I've shaded it is because this is the regime where shocks form, right? So as long as we're in the in the top left top left part of this uh, of this phase space, the two particles have not yet crossed, and so we don't have a shock. And it's really when we when we leave the sort of shock free zone here and we enter the shock zone, which is on the bottom right, that's where, when a shock forms. And now what we can do is we can reparameterize phase space by instead keeping track on the y-axis of the relative position, the relative difference in the position, and on the x-axis of the mean position of the two particles. So basically, we just rotate the picture on the left to the picture on the right. And now, if you have done some sort of constraint optimization, this trajectory looks quite familiar because it's basically the trajectory of minimizing a linear function with a projected gradient method, right? Where the constraint is that we stay in the positive in the positive half space here. So we follow our gradient, follow our gradient, follow our gradient until we hit the boundary. And then as we follow the gradient, we keep getting projected to the feasible set because we're doing a projected gradient descent method. And so we, we sort of scratch along the boundary of the, of the feasible set. And, um, and so it's really, uh, now, now this sort of geometric perspective on the, uh, on the shock formation basically means that shocks form when we hit the feasible set and then sort of continue along the boundary of the feasible set. That's really what a, what a shock is in the Burgess equation. And um, now we know that in optimization, there are alternatives. So ideally what we would like to have is we would like to modify now our, our pass so that instead of, of sort of hitting the boundary and, and being continuing exactly on the boundary, we would like them to instead asymptote towards the boundary. So that we ensure that we have the same long-term behavior while at the same time avoiding to actually hitting the boundary to have this like this sort of singular shock form. And we know from optimization that there is a class of method that does this, that sort of preserves strictly feasible iterates throughout the optimization process, which are interior point methods. And so the idea is now what we want to do is we want to develop interior point methods for PDE, so interior point methods for the Euler equation that uh, preserve the as long-term asymptotic behavior of the of these particle paths, while at the same time avoiding to actually hit the boundary, so preserving strict feasibility. And so, if you're uh, familiar with the sort of literature on interior point methods, these methods are usually defined by a sort of by means of a potential, um, uh, by means of a potential that uh, or like a barrier function that basically tries to blow up close to the boundary of the constraint set. So the and then one basically solves this linear this, the the linear minimization problem with a regular with a decreasing amount of regularization that is obtained as a multiple of this uh, of this barrier function. And so for this, so these these plots here I have obtained by by using the barrier function above. So the the logarithm in the relative position is what what ensures the positivity of the um, of the relative position. And now the, the, the main remaining problem is that we want to we want to extend this idea to uh, to problems that are not really minimization problems. Like already this analogy between minim like minimization of this linear function uh, and the Burgess or Euler equation was maybe a bit sort of strenuous. And so this seems like a bit of a I don't know a bit of a uh, contrived way of actually trying to to come up with a with a with a new set of equations and so instead we want to take a differential geometric perspective and so what we what we remind ourselves of that the manifold has a sort of so to every point we can associate a tangent space which is basically the point of sort of direction that we that we that an ant sitting on the point of the manifold sort of could walk in then the Riemannian metric at this point gives us a notion of angle, so it allows us to uh, it allows the end to measure an angle locally at that point. And then there's this um, this thing called the exponential map, which says that um, which basically allows the end to start at a point p, and in it and sort of depart in a direction that is given on by an element of the tangent space, and then go straight in that direction for a unit time interval and then end up on a different a new point of the point of the manifold. That's that's the exponential map. And um, so basically it gives us a way of continuing an initial direction to a path that then takes it to, to a different point of the manifold. 
<laughs> and it turns out that we can also view the barrier functions uh, of interior point methods. We can view them as the negative entropies of families of probability distributions. And then this, uh, the, in the field of information geometry, this sort of uh, next to the sort of ordinary Euclidean notion of an exponential map, these barrier functions define a so-called dual exponential map that is obtained by using the gradient to map to an alternative coordinate system that take a straight line in the alternative coordinate system and then map back. So for our purposes, uh, I guess I really the main takeaway is this, uh, this barrier function also by means of information geometry induces an alternative notion of going straight on a manifold. And it just so happens that this alternative notion of going straight on a manifold exactly recovers the solution paths of the interior point methods. So what this means is that now we, 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 can, we can obtain this same picture here, but instead of having to say that, oh, somehow the Burgers equation in that special case looks a bit like a minimization problem, we can just say we want to replace straight lines that were Burgers characteristic in the, in the sort of, in the ordinary Burgers equation. We want to replace them with straight lines according to the sort of dual exponential map. And so straight lines, according to the geometry that's induced by this sort of, by this barrier function psi, these are exactly the straight, line, straight lines that I've shown here. And so that gives us a very simple way of modifying the Burgess equation by simply saying, take the Burgess characteristics, but instead of having them be straight lines in the Euclidean sense, have them straight lines in this, in this dual sense. Now, this, there's one additional sort of complication, which is that we want to extend this, uh, we want to, basically not just treat two characteristics, but we need to treat like an infinity of characteristics at once because we want to, I mean, deal with the solution of a PDE, not just the, the, the movement of two particles. And so um, instead, what we are going to do is we are going to not plug in a particular X in this phi T and instead just treat this, this the solution of the Burgers equation as a straight line in the sort of space of phi T's, or in other words, on the manifold of diffeomorphisms. And so that's where there's this connection to the, um, the classical field of geometric hydrodynamics, so in particular, this perspective of viewing solutions of uh, Euler, therefore Burgers equations as geodesics or manifolds diffeomorphisms is due to Vladimir Arnold. And then we basically get the exact same picture, only that we now have a sort of an inequality constraint at every point because we want the derivative to be positive at every point. Um, and so we get basically the same barrier function just that we integrate point-wise everywhere. And then we we compute the uh, we have we compute the sort of uh, the embedding curvature to get this sort of uh, to get this uh, um, uh, this dual geodesic. And one more thing I want to uh, mention is that what's an impeding feature of this regularization that it directly extends to the multivariate equation simply by replacing the logarithm with the log determinant. So that's the barrier function um, for uh, interior point methods in semi-definite programming. And um, I just want to show, um, I'm almost done. I just want to show a few sort of uh, numeric examples. So when we apply this one to the uh, Burgers equation, we see that if we use the lux friedrich scheme that uh, introduces numerical viscosity, we see that, it, that we have a resulting excessive energy dissipation. Uh, if we use the lux vendorov scheme, which is a higher order scheme, we, we have these sort of Gibbs oscillations due to the singularity of the solution. But if we have a Lux-Vendorf scheme with information geometric regularization, we see that we, we, we get something that is stable, but avoids the excessive diffusion of the, uh, the Lux-Friedrich scheme. And so similarly, we, we get a similar picture for the Euler equation, just that uh, the, um, the Lux-Vendorf actually, actually blows up. We also capture the right shock speeds, which is very important for applications. And as we decrease the alpha, we seem to converge to the sort of nominal viscosity solution. And we have some simple two-point, two-dimensional examples of this as well. So the summary is we have this like new way of regularizing the Euler equation. Um, we can maintain sharp but non-singular shocks. And there's lots and lots of uh, follow-up work to do to figure out what are the best ways of solving these equations numerically, uh, what are the basic sort of existence properties of this uh, new system of PDEs, uh, how to use it for adjunct state method and so on. But uh, sorry, I went a few minutes over time, but with this, I want to conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you, uh, Florian, for the very uh, 
mathematical talk. I think everybody appreciated it. Um, I guess uh, in true uh, tradition, I, I guess I'll start with some questions. Um, so I wanted to go back to the, the first part of your talk where you mentioned something about uh, solving uh, non-local equations uh, with with your method. I didn't quite get that because I thought the purpose of that um, section of the talk was about uh, determining the solution operator, or did I misunderstand you? Uh, yes, no, that, that that is correct. That is, uh, I, I'm glad that that became clear. Yes, it's it's about solving solution operators, but the, I mean, one, so you, you talk about like the application to fraction operators, is that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the idea was, so for fractional, uh, in some sense, for for many of these of the problems, if you know the the if you, if you know the operator already, right, or if you know the PDE already, and you just want to solve it, then of course you wouldn't have to do this. You do, would just use a fast solver. And for instance, there are fast solvers based on that same Pulaski idea and based on numerous other ideas. Um, but for fractional orders, it's a bit like the kind of fast solvers that we have at our disposal. From my understanding, seems to be a lot more limited, in particular because the the input, I mean, PDE operator is already non-local. And so that makes it sort of, makes it harder to apply, I guess, many of the sort of locality sparsity or like hierarchy sparsity, like multigrid type methods to fractional order operators. And so, but what is very surprising is that even, even though the, the differential operator is local, the sparsity of these Koleski factors actually still present. So that's, that's really kind of wild that we have a non-local differential operator with a non-local solution operator, but somehow the Koleski factors of the solution operator are still uh, are still approximately uh, approximately sparse. And so what that then means is that I can maybe take like a more expensive method. For instance, I can use a I can do something like use an FFT together with a, an iterative solver to paint painstakingly slowly solve a number, solve the solution, solve this uh, fraction operator for a number of right-hand sides. And then I could use this method to, because I only need the pull logarithmic number of, of, of these solves, I could use this method to sort of stitch these right-hand sides together to get a sort of very fast online way of evaluating the solutions of this fraction operator for new right-hand sides. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it reminds me. So, in in it's not a hundred percent related, but uh, I I wrote a paper with uh, Stefan Dahlke and uh, Helmut Habrecht uh, last year or so, um, concerning control of like non-local equations. And both uh, Stefan and Helmut are uh, from this wavelet community, and that's why when I saw you using Ha wavelets, uh, it's it seemed rather familiar to me. And one of the things that uh, that they pointed out was that uh, for the fractional operators that can be written as integral operators. If the kernel and the integral operator has a certain kind of, um, uh, let's say, growth property with respect to, to its partial derivatives, um, then you get this, uh, let's say, matrix from discretizing the non-local operator that is not quite sparse because there's all these little little bits and pieces, but then there's a compression um, procedure that you can use that gives you this nice sparse structure in the end anyway. And I was wondering if it was somehow related to, to what you showed, but I think that'll be a much deeper uh, so, so brief. So, so generally for for wavelet type approximation schemes, so there is those like classical, and I know like Helmut has has worked on like has been like a very important contributor to that line of work. But basically, yeah, that says that for asymptotically smooth operators, the higher order derivatives vanish faster and faster. And then, so if you use a wavelet that has enough sort of vanishing moments, you get a sort of uh uh the uh decay rate that sort of matches the number of vanishing moments that you put into the into the wavelet. So what's interesting is that 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 basically on the level of the Koleski factorization you get exponential decay mm -hmm. even if you just use the Haar wavelet. Oh, yeah. okay. So in some sense even though like if you want to approximate the operator itself sparsely you need to use a high order sort of wavelet and you only get algebraic decay according to the order of the wavelet and of Whereas if you just compute this sort of Koleski factor, you actually get a um, you get an exponential decay even if you use the 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 high wavelet, even the lazy wavelet, so the, the dumbest of all wavelets, if you will. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, great. So then the, the second uh, question was related to the second part of your talk. Um, so you use this uh, this game theoretic approach uh, to, in a sense, I guess you would say, robustify the uh, the training of the the neural network behind uh, this this, uh, this differential equation 
Um, and you, you say you write it basically as a, a non-competitive uh, Nash equilibrium problem. Uh, as, problem. This is correct, right? Uh, competitive, it's fully non-zero basically. Yeah, so it's it's uh it's a, it's a, a wait you said a competitive or non-competitive competitive competitive right so it's a competitive Nash equilibrium problem with two players but as far as I can tell there there is no convexity involved because of the the structure of the the neural network uh, approximations for the variables you're supposed to be solving for so like do you have any indication that that there exists an actual pure strategy Nash equilibrium for this problem well I mean I guess the the idea usually is, is that that Nash that the sort of neural networks I guess the, the sort of running assumption that neural networks can approximate any function and then basically the the existence of a Nash equilibrium kind of re reduces to the existence of a Nash equilibrium just in this sort of bilinear problem at least for for at least for li linear PDEs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's still but even the the bilinear thing would. Well, okay, I guess by if you look at it as like yeah, is, is by convex, so and that's why why that has a has a sort of Nash. I mean, basically the net like if you if if the if the U can uh like if the pin can produce the exact solution of the PDE, yeah, then that gives and and the discriminator can produce zero, then that is the that is a Nash equilibrium. Ah. Because there's no way for either to to improve. The saddle point formulation and yeah. the derivative is zero, right? That's the guy you're looking for. Mm. Or am I getting this wrong? Yeah, but ma mini max problems uh, would mean that it, you have a non-smooth objective in a sense, right? Because you have, you're looking at like the maximization of the minimization of something, and so if you sort of fix the p as some kind of inner variable, then it's not just a matter of saying I differentiate the objective with respect to d, because there's not necessarily derivative. It's not smooth in that sense. All right. But if you write or, it this way as like a zero sum game and it's bi convex, so to speak, in the D and the P, uh, and you have enough, let's say, compactness in the D and the P feasible sets, then you can use a result from Van Marman to say that there exists a solution. Yes, yes, yes. But I think here yeah. for like a linear P or so, it can be can be simpler to show yeah. that this actually makes sense. Yeah, but the D, how do the D and the P enter into the into those? Uh, I mean, I mean, look, I would look at it. I mean, what you say is correct, but I would look at it yeah, in a more pedestrian. I like pedestrian ways. So uh, it's just that you say if you if the pin produces produces you, then simply this this part here is just always going to be zero if the pin produces the exact solution. Yeah. And so there's no way for for the um, and if the, so if the pin produces the exact solution and the discriminator produces zero. Then simply both terms here are zero, so there's no way for either player to improve upon it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good point. Yeah, that's I think. Mm. Yeah, that's also what yeah. what what happens when you take this L, yeah. take the derivative and set it zero. That's what is giving mm. you back. Mm. But like otherwise, I mean, minimax problems have been around for uh, longer than I've been alive, uh, and and I'm wondering if there there aren't um, better methods than than doing the, the like this alternating coupled gradient descent method that you that you use to to solve it to get even more i mean the results you got were very good compared to what was uh to what's out there but i'm wondering if you can get let's say even better results in a sense um so <clears throat> so i i mean of course I'm, I'm biased in this but i think that this so the CGD seems to work quite well i mean we tried some for instance, extra gradient methods as well just to have some sort of to, to disentangle a bit the sort of CG versus like the optimization method. Yeah. And so we found, I mean, the, the basically without step size adaptation, the extra gradient performed somewhat similar to the CGD, but we found that when we add um, step size adaptation, we do uh, we do actually like, we, we, we're basically not able to get like the Adam version of extra gradient to, to not diverge on this. Mm -hmm. um, and then just to comment on, on the on the third part of your talk um so you mentioned interior point as a, as a means of uh of essentially solving you know a simple uh 1d problem here or a bound constraint problem um i mean i guess interior point is is uh it's not the easiest method in terms of let's say tuning the alpha Right and and making sure that when you you take a step uh, in your subproblems with a given alpha that you don't sort of overstep the bound and you have to like 
pull yourself back into the feasible set with a um, a properly uh, uh, chosen step size strategy. Do you have that issue here at all? Because I know this isn't optimization, but I'm just thinking about sort of a standard uh, interior point method for let's say linear programming where uh, you can't just uh, choose alpha however you want and then apply Newton to that subproblem and take a step and be assured that you're sort of inside the feasible set. You have to pull yourself back into the interior. Do you have some kind of step size strategy that you have to use here? To well, in some sense, it enters. So, so this is, I mean, the, the end result of this is really just a different PDE, which is somehow why. So, so in some sense, it just becomes a matter of solving the geodesic equation for the, right? So we, 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 we find the sort of, I turn it to, I mean, the sort of like dual exponential map as a way of recovering the sort of the trajectories of this idealized interior point method. And then it just becomes a matter of solving these, <clears throat> solving these sort of geodesic equations. And these geodesic equations end up being exactly the sort of like once you express them in your learning coordinates, they end up being exactly this PDE. And then so, so all the problems of like step size there basically when you start discretizing this PDE, I mean, that's basically where all these sort of things are going to enter just as a, I mean, as a, as a variant of like choosing the time step small enough so, so that you're converging and, and that kind of stuff. So that's, that's where, the, where, where, where this, this sort of difficulty ends up in. Yeah. But where do you get this alpha equals uh, H squared? Uh, oh, so that is, so that is just for, for practical purposes, basically, like um, what, what we, what seems to be the, the alpha that one needs to, uh, in order to regularize the solution enough so that the shock is sort of on a like or this like smooth out shock like thing is on a scale of the mesh length. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so I mean that also makes sense because when we choose alpha proportional to h square, because if you look at this elliptic problem here, um, this is really a sort of a um basically this is an elliptic problem uh with a uh with a mesh size of the order uh, sorry with a diffusion length scale of the order uh, a, um o, um of the order uh, um h if you choose alpha equal to h squared because if you choose alpha equal to h squared then this matrix here is is well conditioned because you have an h you have an inverse h square from the second derivative here that cancels with the h square and um so so that's basically what this what this elliptic problem does it sort of like it 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 allows this sort of correction term to 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 move around momentum on the scale of the of the mesh size but do you have to let's say then iteratively solve this method uh, this pde for decreasing alpha or uh, do you just keep alpha fixed at some small value oh you just keep alpha fixed you just keep alpha fixed at a small value and and that's a, that's basically a uh, I guess, uh, I mean, that's a sort of a hyperparameter, so to speak. So, and, and this sort of alpha approximately equal to a square gives, uh, gives some guidance of how to choose it. We found it to be dependent, but only very mildly dependent on the Mach number. Yeah. I mean, that, that goes back to sort of what I was saying earlier, like with traditional interior point, you, you fix alpha, you have your, your, let's say primal dual system, you take one Newton step. And then uh, you you step to the boundary, pull yourself back in, and and adapt the um, the uh, the violation of complementarity, which is basically alpha. Uh, and so you 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 like each Newton step you do. So the alpha here is not the weight of the barrier function. Ah, okay. Where is the weight? The alpha of? here is a way of constructing the is a the parameter that determines the barrier function. Uh huh. So psi is the barrier function. And so if you were to plug this into uh, into an interior point method, you would basically solve the problem, minimize your linear functional plus beta or some gamma or whatever times psi. Uh-huh. I mean, but it is in front of the log there. Yes, but the but but so the, the barrier function here, we don't want to just use the log itself as a barrier function because that would mean that we fully forget the geometry that governs the original equation. Mm. So what we want is we want to have a we basically we're adding the Euclidean barrier function, which would just give you grain descent. We're adding it to the log barrier function to get a sort of a trade-off between the two geometries. So far away from the boundary, it's sort of far away from the boundary, this log term, because the alpha being small becomes negligible. And so we basically become Euclidean. And it's only close to the boundary that we want to the geometry to deviate from the Euclidean geometry. Oh yeah. Okay. Very nice.
So I've had asked enough questions. What about you guys? There's something in the chat. Too. Oh, there's something in the chat. Sorry about that. Uh, so Charlie asked. Uh, yeah, so Charlie had a bunch of questions. I don't know if you could see in the chat. Uh, maybe you can can check them instead of me reading it off. Um, see it. Oh yeah. So so it depends on. <clears throat> so for the first question, it depends a bit on on I guess what the exact sort of like theoretical setup is you're using. So if you're using the setup of of uh, Green's functions of elliptic PDEs with 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 rough coefficients, so or not so with possibly rough coefficients, so with general coefficients and dirty boundary conditions, then yes, to the to my to my knowledge, this sparse Kuleski gives uh, the, the the best uh, so sort of accuracy versus complexity of existing method because it basically improved like this the previous best rig at least of all existing rigorous methods. So the previous best rigorous results were were basically H matrix based methods based on the sort of off-diagonal rank decay results of Bebendorf. But it turns out that the sparse Koleski is able to improve by uh, by by some log factors uh, upon these uh, upon what one can get with H matrices. And there's actually some sort of nice correspondence where you can write, like when you have this sparse Koleski factorization, um, let me pull this up. So if you basically so if you take so we have these theoretical results on how on the decay of these Koleski factors. Now, if you do the following, if you if you remember that the Koleski factorization can be written in additive way, so you can write as a sum of the of the outer product of the columns of the Koleski factors, and then you count for a given off-diagonal block how many rank one updates hit that block, you recover exactly the uh, the results of Bebendorf. Of the off-diagonal rank decay of these of, of, of the of the H matrix approximates. However, somehow the fact that these <clears throat> that these uh, these uh, basically one one of these rank one updates can hit multiple of the H matrix blocks that sort of leads to an additional uh, leads to an additional level of how to say uh, compression, if you will, that shaves off a log fact log factor in the computation. That's why why these kind of structures can be can be more efficient than H matrices. But I would also I should say that goes to the second question. They do hold the the the, 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 the because of the same argument. The the methods that can be approximated by the sparse Koleski factorization are a subset of the H of things that have an H matrix approximant. And um, in particular, there are <coughs> things like once if you add a if you add even less the diagonal to your kernel. Then you act, then these screening effect based methods don't work out of the box anymore. So we have some ways of adapting them, but that's just that's just to show that uh, there is there definitely exist matrices that are approximable through this H matrix uh, way of, way of going about it that that do not fall within this like that within so sort of sparse Koleski setup. And so um, yeah, I guess that kind of answers the second question. But be free to uh, ask a follow up if you want. Okay, great. Let me pause the recording. Thank you again, Dorian.